In Messianic Judaism, there are two primary perspectives on how to best negotiate the dynamics between Torah, rabbinic tradition, and being led by the Holy Spirit. One tends to emphasize Torah observance and following rabbinic tradition as the proper way to live out our calling as Messianic Jews, while the other tends to de-emphasize Torah observance and rabbinic tradition in favor of freedom in the spirit. Today, we have two guests who have thought carefully about these issues. We have Messianic Jewish scholar, Dr. Jennifer Rosner. She is a professor at Fuller Theological Seminary and teaches at the King's University and Messianic Jewish rabbi, Joshua Lassard of Tree of Life Messianic Fellowship in Tallahassee, Florida, who received his MDiv from the King's University. And they recently co-authored the book, At the Foot of the Mountain, Two Views of the Torah and Spirit where they do a fantastic job of representing these two streams of thought in their own unique ways and charitably engage with the other's position. They definitely successfully argued for the sake of heaven, which I am sure will be replicated here today. And so links to the book and where to find more of their work can be found in the description. So before we give the floor to our wonderful guests, Jonathan, how about you tell us more about what we have in store in our discussion today? Yes, yeah, so here's how today's moderated discussion is going to run. So Rabbi Josh and Dr. Rosner will each have a few minutes to present their views on the Torah and the Spirit's role in the lives of Messianic Jews and their congregations. Then we'll have three 15-minute periods discussing more specific subtopics, and then another period of more miscellaneous Q&A before they offer their parting words. And with that, let's get right into this. Rabbi Josh, how about you start us off? I will. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Eric, it's, uh, and of course, Jennifer. Uh, it's great to be here with, uh, with you all to discuss something that, um, that Jen and I feel is very, uh, a very important thing that we have got to grapple with in the Messianic movement. And that is, um, it really gets to the root of how do we define ourselves? Um, and um, I've kind of been on both sides of this uh, spectrum myself. I uh, spent quite a few years being much more on the traditional side, um, always in love with God, in love with the presence of God, the spirit of God, always wanting the gifts of the spirit and so forth. Uh, so I understand that leaning towards tradition doesn't necessarily mean you want to, uh, you know, put everything to this of the spirit aside. Uh, but at the same time, I did start to see uh, a difficulty in balancing those two things. And I just really poured myself into uh, the New Testament, into especially the writings of Paul. And, uh, and I just said, God, wherever you lead me in this through the scriptures, that's where I want to land. And, um, and so I just really dove into the scriptures, drove in, dove into Paul especially, and um, came away, of course, still loving Torah and, and, and love Torah to this day. But my approach to it is different. Uh, my approach to it is not terribly traditional. And, um, but opening myself up more and more to the spirit of God uh, and, and finding that as I uh, emphasized freedom in the spirit more, um, the more the spirit actually moved in my life, in my congregation, uh, in my, above all, in my own development. Uh, one of the things that we have to um, grapple with is how do we define success? How do we define success as a messianic movement, as messianic congregations, as messianic Jews, and to put anything in there other than, is my heart pleasing to God? And am I living out that heart as he would have me do, can kind of de-emphasize that issue, intentionally or not. At least it did for me. And so I, I just wanted to pull myself away and just say, okay, God, let me focus on my heart. I, I'm seeing some things in my life where, you know, I'm losing my temper at times when I shouldn't. I'm not exhibiting the love of Messiah like I should. And um, not, I'm not the man of God that I think I need to be. And um, 
And so as I open up myself to the spirit to find success purely on those terms, am I bearing the fruit of the spirit? Am I uh, loving people with the love that took Yeshua to the cross? Um, then I started to see the spirit move in, in powerful ways. And, and that's my message to the messianic movement. Um, and, and we're going to get more deeply into this, I'm sure. I'm not saying we need to shun all tradition. I'm not saying we need to, um, you know, just chuck it out the back door. And exactly what I'm saying, the nuances of that and, and the nuances of what Jen is saying will be worked out. And there will be some overlap, um, some important overlap. Uh, there will also be some differences. And so uh, I just want to say here at the beginning, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not the anti-tradition guy that everything traditional is is old and, and it's the old yeast let's get rid of it uh but it is a matter of emphasis that we're talking about here and um so anyway i, I think that's uh that'll wrap up my opening statement like i said we'll work out these things more as we discuss further on thank you rabbi josh and now dr rosner uh, would you give us a few words on the topic yeah, sure. I mean, I just wanted to say one thing, first of all, about the book that Josh and I wrote together. It was a really neat project in that, um, first of all, Josh and I are family. He is my husband's brother, so we know each other pretty well. Uh, Josh was also in my Messianic Jewish Theology class at the King's University, which was kind of the genesis of the book. Uh, of course, he got an A plus in the class because he's a very sharp thinker, but we had some differences along the way. And so once the class ended, uh, Josh kind of continued the conversation via email and, uh, and eventually said, hey, Jen, why don't we um, kind of formalize this email correspondence back and forth? And if at the end of the day, we decide it's, it's, it's something that's worth sharing, let's try to publish it. So that's kind of the story behind the book. Uh, so again, not only are Josh and I family in, in, in a very real sense, but, but the, the book was kind of born out of this experience of, of working together in an academic setting. Um, and I think it's really interesting that Josh kind of opened his introduction by saying that he sees both sides of the issue, not only sort of intellectually, but both exper but experientially as well, that he started out uh, or, or at some point in his life was, was kind of more on the traditional end of the spectrum and has had this journey to the place where he is now. And I have almost the opposite journey, which is fascinating. I mean, I became a believer in Messiah in the context of a vineyard Christian church. Uh, which is very focused on the work of the spirit, the leading of the spirit, uh, spiritual gifts. Um, and that was deeply impactful in terms of my understanding of what it means to follow Messiah. And yet my journey through many years has led me to a much more sort of Torah observant expression of faith in Messiah uh, than I than I was previously. So it's it's fascinating to me that Josh and I have these um, kind of complementary journeys in one sense, having moved in opposite direct directions along the spectrum that, that Eric mentioned at the beginning. So uh, with regard to this book, uh, I'll say a couple of things. Um, first of all, I think that in the Messianic Jewish movement, uh, pneumatology, a doctrine of the Holy Spirit, is underdeveloped. There's not been a lot of ink spilled or you know, discussions had at conferences and things like that on how do we think uniquely from a Messianic Jewish theological perspective about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so I think, I posit that thinking about the, the coming of the Spirit, the work of the Spirit uh, from a Messianic Jewish perspective needs to be done in some kind of conversation with the rabbis and Jewish tradition. And so ultimately, I wonder if approaching pneumatology, again, the doctrine of the spirit from a messianic Jewish perspective is going to look slightly different than pneumatology from a traditional Christian perspective. And so here and in, in other, you know, things that I've written elsewhere, I propose what I call a bilateral pneumatology, which is kind of picking up on Mark Kinzer's language of bilateral ecclesiology, where he suggests that that there's sort of these two different and, and somewhat separate, but very much united wings of the body of Messiah, a, a, a Gentile wing and a Jewish wing. And so Mark Kinzer, one of his core assertions is that following Messiah looks slightly different for Jews than it does for Gentiles. And he, you know, looks at supporting texts, which we'll hopefully get into in this conversation to make that claim. And so at some point I began wondering, um, 
wait a second, if there's this thing called bilateral ecclesiology, does that mean that every doctrine of theology, you know, I, my PhD is in systematic theology, so you look at doctrines, Christology, pneumatology, eschatology, I, I started to wonder, does that mean that our Messianic Jewish reflection on all theological doctrine is going to follow some kind of bilateral paradigm? And so, I don't, I don't think I use that phrase in this book, but that's the framework that informs my perspective on the topic, which is uh, what would a bilateral pneumatology look like? What might it mean to say that our reflection on the doctrine and the coming of the Holy Spirit from a Messianic Jewish perspective might indeed look a bit different than reflection on the coming of the Holy Spirit from a non-Jewish context and perspective? And again, I think that has a lot to do with our um our disposition regarding rabbinic, the rabbis, rabbinic tradition, and, and Jewish practices. So that gives a little bit of context for, um, for my perspective in the book. All right. Well, thank you guys for that wonderful introduction. And so just to start off this conversation to explore some topics a little bit more in depth, we'll start with the, the first topic, which is going to be centered around scripture. And so the, the questions to, to guide this conversation will be, is one of the purposes of the Torah to maintain the distinction between Israel and the nations? If so, does the New Testament affirm or overturn this purpose? And Dr. Rosner, how about you start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, I think in order to answer that question, I would go back a little bit further. I would actually go back to Tanakh, uh, the Old Testament, as Christians call it. And I would point out that a clear theme that we see uh, throughout Tanakh is this theme of uh, hostility and animosity between Jew and Gentile. So the nations are those who continually drag Israel away from covenant faithfulness and thwart Israel's ultimate possession of the land. So you see this continual sort of clashing between Israel and and the nations. It's its not the only theme of Tanakh, but it's a repeated theme throughout Tanakh. And so I think one of the remarkable aspects of the community of Messiah is that Messiah brings peace between Jews and Gentiles, between Israel and the nations, enabling us to partner in receiving God's coming kingdom. I would say that that's uh, one of the touchstones of what Messiah brings is he tears down, right, this dividing wall, Ephesians 2, uh, between Jews and Gentiles, which has which has endured throughout the story of God's people. And so Messiah's coming is, 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 is something like the prophetic fulfillment of verses like Isaiah 19, 24, where, where God says, in that day, Israel will be the third alongside with Egypt and Assyria, casting a vision for the day on which the nations will also enter into covenant with Israel's God. Uh, and it, that, that verse from Isaiah 19 is even more powerful if we Think about Egypt in the Exodus story, right? In the Passover drama. If we think about Assyria uh, with regard to the conquering of the Northern Kingdom, that's an incredible vision that these nations, the Gentiles, will also enter into covenant relationship with, with Israel's God. And so I think that um, the law does reinforce distinction between Jew and Gentile, but but more primarily than that, I would say that without that distinction, uh, we wouldn't be able to marvel at Messiah's remarkable work of reconciliation between Jew and Gentile. So it's sort of Jews as Jews and Gentiles as Gentiles that are brought together as one in the body of Messiah. And that is what's so incredible about this uh, community of Messiah. And I think that, so yes, yeah, so that's that's sort of my, the background to my response of this question, does Torah preserve the distinction between Jew and Gentile? It does. And the reason that matters is because only through that lens are we able to see this particular aspect of Messiah's work, which is bringing harmony, bringing peace, bringing fellowship uh, between these two groups, where if we look at those two groups in Tanakh, that, that's that's not what we see. I mean, this is a, this is a theme that um, the scholar Kendall Solon picks up on quite strongly in his work that that there becomes this posture of mutual blessing uh, 
Uh, we see this in the New Testament, and I would argue that we, we at least should see it in the community of Messiah today. Uh, but it's not, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't make sense if you don't have Jews identifiable as Jews who are who are in some sense distinct from Gentiles who are identifiable as Gentiles. I mean, it, 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 along these lines, it, uh, it makes sense to me why Paul uh, in Galatians 3 uses Jew and Gentile sort of alongside male-female as these kind of two groups, both of which uh, are enabled to enter into a new kind of relationship with one another in Messiah. So, uh, in, so there's no longer hierarchy. There's no longer status. There's no longer tension or animosity between the two groups. Um, and I think that is why, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it matters that there is an ongoing distinction between Jew and Gentile, which I would argue the New Testament affirms. Uh, Josh might have a different reading on some of those passages, but I think um, it's not just distinction for the sake of distinction, and it's certainly not distinction for the sake of hierarchy or status, which is very well what it may have been in, in Second Temple Jewish times, which is why Paul is like, uh-uh, like we're, that ends in Messiah. I don't think that Paul is arguing that the distinction ends in Messiah. And I think one of the reasons that's theologically significant is because in this kind of new relationship between Jews and Gentiles that's enabled in Messiah, uh, we see the outworking of God's ultimate plans for redemption uh, and for the coming of God's kingdom. So, so yes, I think Torah preserves distinction, and 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 that's why I think it matters and is sort of theologically dis theologically significant to sort of talk about that distinction, which which as I said, I believe does endure throughout the New Testament, and I think it's a it's a fairly significant theme in the New Testament. All right, Rabbi Josh, do you agree with Dr. Rosner's assessment of uh, the narrative presented in the Tanakh about? Uh, Jew and Gentile and reconciliation, or do you view things a little bit differently? Right. Uh, good question. I do see that narrative uh, in Scripture, but I don't see it as as the main narrative. And and I think that we have to be careful to keep the primary things the primary things. The, to me, the primary narrative is not Israel and the nations, but the earth and God, the people and God. And, and Israel becomes the representative of earth. And it, it, so, so, yes, there, there's tension between Jews and Gentiles for sure. Um, but at the same time, Israel serves as the priests of the nations, not, not the enemies of the nations. And so the representatives as well, uh, they, they, they like Israel kind of embodies... Adam, in, in a sense, and becomes the representative of humanity before God. And so the main narrative is Israel's reconciliation to God, the world's reconciliation to God, and, and maintaining too much of an emphasis on the distinction, I think, can erase the idea of Israel being the Gentiles' representatives and becoming one and, and of course that gives way to to messiah you know paul talks about messiah uh, in romans and in other places as being the second adam he is now the reconciler of humanity to god through the blood of, of, of the cross this is god's reconciliation plan uh, now once reconciled um so talking about messianic Jews and Christians who are genuinely saved, once reconciled to maintain too much of its distinction between the two groups is to say that the reconciliation plan didn't fully happen. Um, so I think that there's a sphere on which I don't ontologically see myself as different from my Christian brothers and sisters. I see myself having a different testimony of how God's reconciliation plan reaches Jews, reaches Gentiles, reaches Africans. And so within, within that, I maintain my Judaism. Um, I, often, uh, I often give a picture something like this, that the kingdom of, of God is like 
a, a table set for the set for the Lord's table, communion, the Eucharist, whatever you want to call it, where we sit down and we partake of the body and the blood of of Messiah, and um, and to be at that table and to see no Chinese people there, you know, something's missing. To be at that table and to see no Africans there, so, something's missing, right? There's, there's the church, the body of Messiah is supposed to be the, um, you know, not just, you know, Paul asks, is he, is he the God of the Jews only? No, he's the God of the Gentiles as well, or getting that a little off, but it's in Romans 3 there. But for too long, there's been no Jews at that table. And so what I see here is a need for Jews as Jews to be at the table. But as I'm partaking of it, I'm just partaking as somebody who's filled with the spirit of God. Uh, somebody who, um, uh, somebody who's saved by the blood of Messiah the same way as anyone else. And in that newness, I have to then approach Torah differently because th there is an approach to Torah that's got to change in, in that new creature that I am. Um, and so, and, and Jen wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. I, she understands, in fact, she says in the book, something changes, right? And, and I think that, um, she doesn't express in the book what it is. Maybe in this discussion she will, um, or or maybe it's just something that I've developed a little further in that particular case. What changes? What changes? And 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 how are we going to define Torah? And how are we going to define what changes? And and the the difficulty of this discussion is that there's so many different terms we have to fully flesh out. What do we mean when we say Torah? Right. Uh, so. When I say Torah, do I mean like the main thrust of Torah? Am I talking about everything, all the minutia, all the tiny little laws? Am I talking about the rabbinic development of, of Torah? But, but Torah as its aim, as its goal, is constant, hasn't changed. What, what was its goal? That of love. It's wrapped up over, and it's, it's uh, uh, capsulized over and over again as love by Paul, by Yeshua. Uh, this is the Torah, this is the prophets, you know, to do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. Um, love is the fulfilling of the law, because love does no wrong to a neighbor, Romans 13, 10, etc. And, and so, however, in that main goal of Torah, to, um, in, that, in that main goal of Torah to bring us to a heart of love, uh, it was given to a people that were unregenerated, okay? And, and that's not a, a, a diss on Jewish people, on our ancestors. It's just saying before Messiah came, we were an unregenerated people, anybody, right? Not saying the spirit was absent, not saying the spirit didn't move, didn't work, but, but that Titus 3, 5, you know, we've been renewed, we've been regenerated by the spirit, uh, that hadn't happened yet. In Romans 8, right, Paul says, Messiah has done what the Torah couldn't do, right, because of our sinfulness. And so in this giving uh, the Torah to the people of Israel, hey, I want you to be love. I want you to be holy. Uh, apart from the death, the, the resurrection, the outpouring of the Spirit in Messiah, um, it can't quite happen. So we get as close as possible. Okay. You can't quite do this. So I'm going to lay it out for you with rule after rule and do this and don't do that and do that. And, and we get wrapped up in the particular laws instead of the heart of it. And, uh, and, and so I, I would say that um, this distinction between Jew and Gentile, we have to remember that not only Gentiles, but Jews as well, have to undergo a metamorphosis in our approach to Torah that fully recognizes that new thing, that beautiful thing that Messiah has done on our behalf. I think your metaphor of table fellowship between Jew and Gentile is a, a very important one to, to think about a little bit more.
And I actually kind of want to use that as a way to transition to Dr. Rosner. And Dr. Rosner, could you explain your position on, you mentioned how you think the New Testament does affirm the narrative that you proposed in the Tanakh. Could you just tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, I would agree that table fellowship is a huge emphasis in the New Testament. And I think that this relates to Josh's question, uh, which which we sort of get into in the book, but he's right. I never, I never sort of lay it out. What do I think? Um, how do I think Jews need to change Jews who follow Messiah? Because if they're continuing to observe Torah, if they're continuing to live Jewish lives and live lives that are circumscribed by Jewish practices, what changes, right? And I think um, I think Josh raises this point a number of times in the book with with regard to um, like having a, a, a sufficiently high Christology, right? Messiah is not just someone who sort of comes along and, and does some things. He's the center of the narrative, right? And so I think this point about table fellowship is absolutely central to the narrative of the New Testament and the, and the witness of the community of Messiah. And I think it's very connected to what needs to change about Jews. I think what needs to change about Jews in large part is their posture and their perspective regarding Gentiles, right? And I think this is where you see this shift that, that I perceive pretty strongly between Tanakh, where the, where the overarching relationship between Jews and Gentiles, Israel and the nations is one of hostility and animosity to the New Testament, where where <clears throat> we come to the table together, right? I mean, this is like that Isaiah 19. Israel, Egypt, and Assyria are sort of there together following Messiah, <clears throat> partaking in the Lord's Supper. I mean, this this vision of, uh, of, of, again, reconciliation, which on the part of the, of, of Israel is saying, these Gentiles are no longer the ones who are keeping us from being in covenant faithfulness, covenant fidelity with God, they're now joining us in that. They're joining us in this grand mission of God and his coming kingdom. And so I think um, this is one of the places where I think uh, Messianic Jews in particular need to be um, discerning, selective. I mean, Josh used the word filter, having a particular filter through which we understand and practice rabbinic tradition. And I think their relationship with Gentiles, the way in which Gentiles are honored and respected as as co-covenanters with God is one of the key changes. So I think um, those two points are connected in my perspective, this Jew-Gentile relationship issue and this sort of what needs to change for Gentiles kind of centers on the table fellowship issue. I think the way that Israel perceives the nations, the way that God interacts with the nations fundamentally changes in the New Testament. And to the extent that the Jewish people don't respond to that don't jump on to that they're sort of missing what's happened in messiah right and so in spaces where jew gentile distinction still engenders hierarchy or uh separation or or whatever that might look like i think that's going to be a problem and i think there are areas in rabbinic tradition where that that distinction is upheld too uh, starkly so i i mean just to give a couple of concrete examples you know, different prescriptions of kashrut have to do with, like, for wine, for example, like, whether or not a Gentile touched the wine, like, that would make it unkosher, and that's a place where I think I would very strongly push back against uh, rabbinic tradition, understanding where that uh, proscription comes from, right, because there's this whole history of, like, blood being put in the wine. I think in our day and age, like, if we're sharing a table with Christians between Messianic Jews and Gentile Christians, like, probably safe to say there's no blood in the wine, uh, at least, you know, in the circles that, that that most of us run in. And so I would say, yeah, the wine's still fine if a Gentile, like, pours a glass of wine. You know what I'm saying? Like, little things like that in rabbinic tradition that have, that, that actually hold uh, quite a bit of um, significance in them. You know, an, a, another example is this whole idea of, like, the Shabbos Goy, you know? So, so in, in many traditional Jewish circles, like, there's, there's Shabbat prescriptions, and then there's you know, well, it's just fine to have a Gentile come do the thing that you're not willing to do. And we've always um, kind of bristled a little bit at that because, you know, what does Torah say? It says like your servant and your ox and like everybody rests on Shabbat. And so again, I think that's um, a distortion of a proper understanding of Jew-Gentile distinction when it's like, well, we Jews, like we don't do this on Shabbat, but like, it's just fine if, if like we call the Gentile neighbor over to do it. And so I think that there's these areas in rabbinic tradition 
where that I would push back against because I don't think they accurately represent what what unity in Messiah looks like, which I think is a different issue than whether or not Jew Gentile distinction endures. So I hope that that provides at least a bit of an answer to, to the question. Yes, that's that's great because this is actually is a perfect segue to the next uh, prompt for discussion we want to have, and that is what place does rabbinic tradition and halakha have in the life of a messianic Jew? Should we view it as authoritative? If so, in what sense? And is there an inherent tension between being led being led by the Spirit and following rabbinic tradition? So, if Rabbi Lesser could uh, could could start us here. Yeah, sure. Um, well. Again, there's a lot of definitions here that um, need to be fully fleshed out, at least the best we can. Um, Jen mentions um, in, in the book and, and in our discussions as well, uh, a certain amount of rabbinic authority. And I, I'm not quite sure what that means. What I like about her view is she understands uh, that Yeshua's authority is is ultimate. You know, if if if, if the rabbis say something such as, uh, you know, we're gonna, you know, keep the Gentiles uh, sequestered, they're they're a lower class or whatever. Uh, she she, you know, she understands the ultimate authority of Yeshua. But what does it mean to have the rabbis have any authority? Um, I don't see rabbinic authority. Um, as being a necessary component of messianic Judaism, but that doesn't mean that rabbinic Judaism and the culture of Judaism at large, which has been guided by rabbinic uh, authority, that it can't color us. You know, I, it definitely it does. You know, there's no reason to um, to overreact against it. Uh, for example, you know, if the rabbis say Passover happens on such and such a date, you know, I, I'll just accept that. I don't need to go look at the moon and then count the days and so forth. You know, they've set a certain color for our people uh, that I see no reason to, to reject. Uh, and, and one of the points I make in the book about following the spirit is remembering that the spirit loves the Jewish people. And if the, if the spirit loves the Jewish people, then that is going to show up in the way that I practice my faith, the way that I practice uh, Messianic Judaism. And so I, I don't see it as having authority. I think there's, there's one authority, and that's the Messiah. I think that he dispenses that authority through the Bible, through, through the written word, and through the guidance of the spirit. Um, and since uh, rabbinic Judaism does not receive ex or accept his authority, then I can't accept theirs. Um, I can accept that God loves them. I can accept that they have uh, wisdom uh, in certain areas. I can accept, certainly accept that they have zeal. Uh, and so there's things that I can learn from rabbinic Judaism. There's a coloring of messianic Judaism that can happen through, uh, through rabbinic Judaism. But to use the word authority, then all of a sudden we start having to balance. Uh, the, the balancing act becomes much more difficult. Um, and and I, I see this in my own life as well. You know, uh, I... Um, I hope this isn't too off topic, but but I was going for a walk once, praying to the Lord, and and felt no, I've 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 got to get back to, uh, got got to get back home because I have to study uh, something for my my Greek professor, and the Lord said to me, no, keep walking, and um, I had to wrestle with that. You know, I made the right decision, followed the Lord. There was a tremendous breakthrough in an area I didn't even realize I needed a breakthrough in, but I had to, to wrestle with that. So anytime we set up alternate authorities in our lives other than Yeshua, there's always going to be that pull that we're going to have to wrestle with. You know, yeah, the, the rabbis say this, but the Spirit's leading me a certain way, and, and there's going to be that grappling. And one of my goals as, as a rabbi, as a messianic rabbi, is to help people 
surrender themselves fully to, to Messiah's authority. And look, the, look, Yeshua can say to somebody, hey, light the candles on the Sabbath. It'll bring uh, some, some direction, some peace into your home, things like that. So if, if it's the authority of the Messiah saying, hey, allow yourself to be colored by the, by the Jewish traditions in this area, fine. Uh, but, but yeah, I, I, I tend to balk at the word authority, especially uh, with those. Look, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> you know, Paul's talking to the Corinthians. He's talking all kinds of problems in Corinth, right? These people are uh, accepting somebody who's horribly sexually immoral. They're, they're fighting with each other. I'm a prophet. I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. All kinds of crazy things going on. And he chastises them for bringing lawsuits before non-believers. And he's like, you know, I'm summarizing here, but he's, he's saying, you as a believer, you have an authority, right? Even the weakest among you should be able to, you can't go to anybody. You have to go to non-believers to get these cases settled. And I think this ties in with, with Yeshua. You know, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples. In other words, th there's this authority in Messiah that he extends to his followers. And then to surrender that to people, however well-intentioned, however intelligent, however zealous, if they don't have Messiah, they don't have Messiah's authority. And so uh, I, I do balk at using that word uh, authority with rabbinic judaism so D dr rosner uh, earlier you mentioned how uh, you can disagree with certain rabbinic traditions in the in the first pump we discuss would that be uh would i understand you correctly to say that you see there as being some type of uh rabbinic authority has some type of authority and if that's the case how would you describe it is rabbi josh um offering a different sense of authority than you would say yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the sharpest um, points of uh, uh, contrast between my position and Josh's position. And I think one way, it might be a little too blunt, but I'm going to say it and then I'll qualify it. Um, I think with regard to these two sort of fundamental categories, the spirit and the spirit's authority, and then rabbinic Judaism or Torah, however we want to we want to call that, uh, I think that I would be more on the side of like, let's assume that we should be following Jewish practices uh, according to the authority of the rabbis, unless the spirit leads us otherwise. And I think Josh would come from the other direction. I think he would say, let's assume that that's not what we should be focused on, unless the spirit leads us to follow some particular dictate of rabbinic Judaism. So I think we approach that from fundamentally kind of opposite perspectives. And so I think Josh uh, has given us a, a pretty good synopsis of why he would say maybe not all of rabbinic practices and, 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 and Torah observances are relevant, but that's not where we should start, right? We should start with the authority of Messiah and Messiah might lead us into some of those practices, but might not. And so let me unpack a little bit why I approach it from the opposite perspective. So I think um, for me, a lot of it comes back to the parting of the ways, right? This, this event that I would say it's not even an event, it's sort of a process that happens over the first two, three, four centuries uh, after Messiah comes, whereby you get Judaism and Christianity increasingly defining themselves in contradistinction from one another, in mutual opposition to one another, such that Judaism and Christianity be become mutually exclusive religious traditions. And that's exactly how they're defined. You cannot be a Jew and a Christian. I mean, the, the, the category that we see in the New Testament of Jewish followers of Messiah basically gets completely erased, such that we have conversion liturgies from the seventh century, whereby if a Jew wanted to become a Christian, they actually have to renounce every ounce of their Jewish identity and Jewish practice and Jewish community and Jewish fellowship so that you really can't be both for many, many centuries, really up until, I mean, you start to get these, these kind of predecessors of, of modern Messianic Jewish movement in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries. But it's really not until the 20th century that you get the re-emergence where it becomes possible once again for a number of reasons to be a Jewish follower of Messiah who embraces Jewish identity. And so I think 
once we get this historical development called the parting of the ways, uh, that informs that informs everything in terms of Jewish and Christian identity after that point. And so what gets missed in the community of Messiah, which becomes the Gentile Christian church, is any meaningful interaction with God's covenant with the Jewish people, right? This is the history of supersessionist Christian theology, right? That stuff is, I mean, if you read the church fathers, it's like, you know, according to Ignatius of Antioch, it's monstrous to, to talk of Jesus Christ and practice Judaism. I mean, that becomes the the model for how these two religious traditions are, are understood. And so in light of that, that's where I think uh, I would argue that rabbinic tradition is uh, guided by God as a way of sustaining the Jewish people. So God has given Torah as a heritage to the people of Israel, and that is precisely what the church, the Gentile church, says no to. They say no to Torah in the midst of following Jesus. So we get this tremendous rupture in, 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 in the history of, of, of the Christian church uh, that creates this mutually exclusive paradigm between Judaism and Christianity. And what I want to say is that um, that's a schism, that's a, that's a rupture, that's a tear in the heart of the people of God, and yet God continues to sustain the life of each community amidst its blind spots, amidst its misunderstanding of the other community. I think God uh, guides the life of the Gentile Christian church, and I think God guides the life of rabbinic Judaism uh, and I think that's God's sovereign work in preserving these two groups that, that that divorce each other from one another, because we don't have, I mean, the Torah needs interpretation, right? It's not straightforwardly clear what it means to honor the Sabbath or what it means to write these words on the doorpost of your house. And so the Torah itself, I think, begs for interpretation and application. And that's precisely what the Jesus movement fails to do after you get the parting of the ways. And that's what the rabbis have been doing ever since. And so if we're looking for a continuous interpretive tradition of how to apply Torah, which is God's heritage to the people of Israel, to our lives, we have nowhere else to look besides rabbinic Judaism. And so if we believe that being and living as Jews has something to do with obeying Torah, with following the, the, the 613 mitzvot, or at least those that are applicable in the absence of a temple, we need some guidance in how to do that. And so this is where I would argue that it is still part and parcel of the calling of the Jewish people to live according to this way of life called Torah that God has handed to the people of Israel. And, and, and that applies to us as Messianic Jews as well. And so if we're going to start with that point to say something about what it means to be Jewish is to live according to this calendar cycle, to live according to this, you know, dietary restrictions. Like if, if we want to say there's some ongoing significance to that, I think we have to look to rabbinic tradition to say, well, what does that mean? What does that mean throughout the changing circumstances of history and the, and the, and the changing eras in which we find ourselves in? And so I do think that God has been at the helm of rabbinic tradition. Does that mean rabbinic tradition gets it all right? No, of course not. They, rabbinic tradition rejects Messiah, as Josh has pointed out, but I don't follow Josh in saying, well, then I reject rabbinic tradition. Because in the same way, I think the Gentile Christian church, if you want to talk about the, the Christian creeds, for example, the Nicene Creed, I can absolutely sign on to the Christology that's put forth in the Nicene Creed. I cannot sign on to the anti-Judaism, anti-Judaistic posture that informed Constantine and those who penned the Nicene Creed. So I see Gentile Christianity and Rabbinic Judaism as these traditions that God has guided, but that have been misguided because of their blindness with regard to the other, because of their misunderstanding of this fundamental relationship between Judaism and Christianity. Uh, and so I think we need to be kind of listening in to both of them. I think there's something like our divorced parents and both of them have something to teach us, and both of them have places where we would need to push back. So there are absolutely areas where I would push back against uh, Orthodox Christianity, right? Where I would say, you know, and this is where, you know, conversations regarding supersessionist trends within Christian theology come up, right? Christianity has missed the boat when it comes to 
God's covenant with the Jewish people. And I would say the same thing for the rabbinic, for rabbinic Judaism, right? Rabbinic Judaism has been, in my perspective, God's guidance of the people of Israel, God's preservation of the Jewish people throughout history and, 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 and societies that have been incredibly hostile to them, mostly Christian and, 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 and later Muslim societies. Um, and so that, that does matter. I mean, that matters. And yes, as I stated before, there are areas where I think we need to critically push back against and question rabbinic tradition. And I believe that's the unique witness of the Messianic Jewish community to do. But by and large, I mean, as Josh said, like the dating of Passover, hearing the shofar on, on Rosh Hashanah, fasting on Yom Kippur, you know, these kinds of things, I think we can take and benefit from because that's what God's kind of called us to do. And so I don't think that we need to push back against every aspect of rabbinic tradition simply because the rabbis rejected Jesus. I think that there's a lot of truth and a lot of power and a lot of um, grace and gifting in God's, uh, this, this legacy of, of following Torah. And, and that's not the same thing as saying that we uncritically follow the rabbis. So I hope that, I hope that distinction makes sense. Yeah, that, that's definitely very helpful. And there's definitely a lot that we will return to when we get to kind of the more miscellaneous Q&A towards the end. But before we get there, I do want to ask both of you, if the Messianic Jewish community uh, were to embrace your view, what impact would that have on individuals, families, congregations, and even the Messianic Jewish community at large, do you think? I think I have to, uh, to really answer that, I do have to go back and, and respond to some of the things Jen said, just so you understand my perspective. But I, I am getting around to your, your question there. Um, I don't see the parting of the ways as the main um, story that, that's going on, I, um, as, as the main issue, the main uh, problem to overcome. I think what happened was a spiritual revival happened uh, as described in Acts 2. And, and then that spiritual revival morphed into something terribly unspiritual. And, and so I think that the, pro, the, the main issue, yes, supersession, supersessionism is, is terrible, it's wrong. I preach against it myself, um, but the, the main issue is not, or, or, or the, the root issue, the, the root issue is not Christians rejecting Jews or Judaism, but, but Christians rejecting the Holy Spirit, so that now, instead of a, a revival movement that was birthed within Judaism, by a Holy Spirit that loves Israel and loves the Jewish people, we have two competing traditions. And, and I see within church history, revivalist movements start to take hold and start to go somewhere and the, the traditionalist trying to squelch that and say, no, we're, we're not giving into that, it's dangerous. Um, uh, and, and so I, I, I see the parting of the ways primarily not in terms of Jew and Gentile, although that certainly was affected by what's at the root of it. But what's at the root of it is the people of Messiah, or at least proclaiming faith in Messiah, forgetting that what makes me a person of Messiah is the marking of the Holy Spirit, as Paul talks about, for example, in, in Ephesians 1. Uh, in Acts 15, you know, there's this debate, do the, Jew, do the Gentiles have to become Jews? Do they have to be circumcised to really follow the Messiah? And, and, and what's the turning point that says, no, they don't? It's not theology. It's they were anointed. Cornelius and his household were anointed by the Holy Spirit of God without being circumcised. And so the people of God have to be defined as those filled with the Spirit, and I think if the church had been filled with the Spirit, they would have continued to love the Jewish people and have a prophetic voice to the Jewish people. And that's one of the things I hope doesn't get lost in, in this idea of giving 
you know, the rabbinic voice, some authority and so forth, it is the fact that we do, by the Spirit of God, have a prophetic ministry to the Jewish people that says you, you need the Messiah, that, that we have, by God's grace, received something that you need, that, that, that Judaism did go astray. And, and, and so, for me, the parting of the waves was, was the, 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 the quelching of the Spirit, and fundamentally. And yes, then it spilled over into, well, we're setting up a competing tradition. If they had been led by the Spirit, they would not have done that. We're competing with uh, tradition where we're going to reject, we're going to separate Easter from Passover and all this stuff. That's not of the Spirit. And so uh, I, I think that's at the root of it. And if you read um, Abraham Joshua Heschel, his book, uh, God in Search of Man, he, um, uh, he, he talks about Torah, and he makes a case for how Torah will change with the coming of the Messiah, and how Torah, the ineffable Torah, I think he called it, it's been a few years since I've read the book, where, where Torah changes depending on who it's being given to and what the circumstances are, there's a sense in which the ineffable Torah is unchanging. But he's, he talks about Torah to Adam and Eve, right? Adam and Eve alone in the garden. Do they need uh, a Torah that says don't steal from people? Of course not. There's no one else to steal from. But still they had a Torah, right? And that it changes de depending on... Uh, the circumstances, the people to whom Torah is given. And, and, and so even if God has used rabbinic Judaism to preserve the Jewish people, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that those who are new creatures will relate to Torah in the same way that those who are, have not undergone that transformation, right? Paul, Paul talks about, uh, in, in Galatians 3, now, before faith came, we were being guarded under Torah, bound together until the coming faith would be revealed. Torah was our guardian to lead us to Messiah. Uh, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a, a guardian. Who's he talking? Now, people say, well, he's talking to Galatians. Galatians are Gentiles. But he's got to be talking about Jews, even if he's talking to Gentiles, because he's saying we, we, we had Torah. Torah was our guardian, the guardian of the Jewish people. Therefore, there's got to be some transformation here in our, in the way that Jewish people relate to Torah. This is not just, um, <clears throat> this is not just, oh, uh, let's welcome in Gentiles now. I, I think there's a fundamental change because we've been fundamentally changed. And I, and I think if you read God in Search of Man, and Abraham Joshua Heschel wasn't a Messianic Jew, but if you see it from that lens, you'll see something fundamentally has changed. Therefore, Torah has to, our approach to it has to fundamentally change. Even if the ineffable eternal Torah remains unchanged, the way it makes its way into my life changes. And so I would love to see Messianic, to get to your <laughs> question now, I would love to see a messianic Judaism that's filled with the spirit, that um, understands the fruit of the spirit, the gifts of the spirit, that loves Israel. And in our love for Israel, yes, we'll be colored by, by Israel's culture. We love the Jewish people. So yes, we're going to, uh, we're going to, uh, it's going to affect our synagogue services. It's going to, it's going, that love is going to affect us and, and, and some more than others. And that's okay. You know, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with those who want to lead a more orthodox life. I don't try to dissuade them from that uh, as long as, and, and I think this is vital, as long as we don't um, equate uh traditional Torah observance with righteousness. It's, it's not the same thing. Uh, righteousness has been defined in the new covenant as having the heart of Messiah by the anointing of the spirit of the Messiah. And th there's just a lot of pitfalls that we have to avoid if we're going to interact too deeply with rabbinic Judaism, right? W w one of those is, th does my observant of the mitzvot, of the commandments, does it give me merit? And I'm going to have to reject that. No, my merit is only in Messiah. 
that that that's all the merit I need. I don't need rabbinic Judaism for merit. I don't need it for identity. Um, can it affect my expression of my faith? Sure, but the fundamental issue of who I am uh, has got to be found in in Messiah alone. And and so I cannot give a, a picture of a messianic Judaism that answers all, this is what it will look like for sure. I don't know, except for the fruit of the spirit. I wanna see people being healed. Uh, and, and, and I've seen some of that. I wanna see more of that. I wanna see prophecy. I wanna, I wanna see Jews and Gentiles loving each other. I wanna see Jewish people come to know the Messiah. I, I wanna see what's on the heart of the Messiah and not take Messianic Judaism and turn it into uh, another tradition to compete against normal Judaism or compete against Christianity. It's not a competition of traditions. It's, am I really living out the fullness of the spirit, the truth of the Messiah in a way that's grounded in that, that high Christology that I have, that the son of God visited us took upon himself our sins, bore it on the cross, rose from the dead, offers us eternal life in him. The spirit of the one who created the heavens and earth dwells inside of me. Um, that theology is going to produce a life that, that I think looks different than anything that you can create apart from it. So God, God bless my Jewish brothers and sisters. And yes, God may have used rabbinic Judaism to, to preserve us uh, to some extent, but that doesn't necessarily mean that in the new creation, I'm gonna approach Torah the, the same way. Dr. Rosner, what do you think the, the vision that you have for Messianic Judaism, what fruit may that bear? And you can also feel free to uh, take note of anything Rabbi Josh just shared as well. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we've been throwing around a lot of terms, rabbinic tradition, Torah, Torah observance. And I think uh, for me, I, I want to go back for a minute and just sort of talk about what Torah is. Again, I think Torah is this rich legacy, this rich kind of gift to the Jewish people. And I think throughout, especially sort of Christian biblical interpretation, I would say largely informed by the parting of the ways, Torah has become law, right? That's how this rich Hebrew word Torah, meaning teaching, gets translated into Greek as law, which then gets like layer upon layer upon layer of baggage saddled on it, such that then we eventually contrast law to grace, right? So, and then we contrast works righteousness to grace through faith and to being justified by Messiah. And I think all of those are kind of false distinctions in to some extent. I don't think that Judaism was ever about works righteousness, about attaining righteousness before God by, you know, doing a, a set of a practices. I think Torah was always the Jewish people's response to God's gracious election of them as his covenant people, right? We see this with Exodus. God rescues his people. Exodus comes first. Then comes Sinai as the rescued, redeemed, elected covenant people of God. God says, this is your heritage. This is how I'm asking you to leave and to live. And so I, I believe that there's inherent richness in us entering into this heritage called Torah. And yes, I mean, there's, as we've sort of touched on, there's a lot of layers to that. There's this whole question of rabbinic Judaism, which we've touched on a bit. Uh, but, but first and foremost, I think that Torah is part and parcel of Israel's election. And that's how God designed it. And I don't read the New Testament as some erasure of that. Uh, I don't think that Torah is now obsolete since Messiah has come. And so I, I think that there's inherent blessing to be found in engaging with Torah, with the tradition of Judaism, with Jewish practices. I think that's something that God has gifted to us. I mean, read the Psalms, right? If we if we kind of have this perspective of Torah as law, and I'm not saying that's strictly Josh's perspective. I think that's a lot of Christ contemporary evangelical Christianity's perspective. And so I, 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 I would say, read the Psalms, like read this language about Torah being more precious than gold and silver, Torah being our delight, these kinds of things. I mean, that's kind of where I would want to nudge the Messianic Jewish movement to the extent that it hasn't done so already to engage in that as a gift from God. And so 
I remember, I mean, again, I became a believer in Messiah in a, in a um, vineyard Christian church. And it wasn't until several years later that I was like, wait, I'm Jewish. Like, how does that matter? And I remember one of my, one of the Messianic Jewish leaders that I was, that I was close with at the time was like, Jen, just like light candles on Shabbat, you know, just like take these little baby steps into Ju Judaism as this rich gift to us. And so I would want to say the same thing, like, let's fast on Yom Kippur. Let's build a sukkah. Let's, let's just see what, what God has for us in these practices, believing that there's richness and blessing and engaging that because it's God's gift to us, right? It's not some list of things we have to do in order to be considered righteous before God. And in that way, I see it as kind of parallel to, or connected in some way to um, like Christian spiritual disciplines. So if I were discipling, you know, a, a new Gentile follower of Christ, a new Christian, I would say, you know, try reading your Bible every day, try fasting, try, you know, practicing some kind of confession. Uh, so I see this sort of parallel between the way that I think Torah functions in the life of, of the Jewish people, including Messianic Jews, and the way that the, the disciplines of the Christian life, right? What does it mean to be a real follower of Messiah? We do these things, we dedicate time, we dedicate energy to pressing into Messiah. And I see this kind of direct connection between those two sets of practices uh, and so I would, I would love to see our movement um, intentionally engaging in certain ways uh, with, again, this, this heritage called Torah, believing that there's something uh, of God to be found in those practices, that those practices are sort of set up as like a meeting place with, with God. Um, and so again, I think, um, I think Josh, Josh would say he doesn't begrudge, you know, Messianic Jews who have a more Torah observant approach. And in the same way, I, I don't begrudge those who, um, who don't, you know, who, who might be a part of traditional Christian churches, for example, Jewish believers in, in church settings. Um, but I would still want to say, what would it look like to take one step in this direction? Not, not as a, a again, as, as kind of like, well, you're a bad Jew if you don't do this, but just as like, what is to be found for us? What spiritual riches might be waiting for us in this set of practices? And in what way can this framework inform our understanding of Messiah's work, our understanding of, of sort of the main contours of the New Testament? And, and I do think that there are different callings for different Messianic Jews that look quite distinct from one another. And I think we see this in the New Testament, right? Paul becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. James is leading the Jerusalem congregation. I think that their disposition towards Judaism and Jewish practice may have been slightly different. Their, certainly their, their callings were different. And I think that's also true in our case. But I would say across the board, what little steps can we be taking um, toward this, this very rich thing called Torah, which, which I believe is God's gift to the Jewish people. And I would say, it's not that we're less spiritual or less righteous or less, you know, fill in the blank. It's that we might be missing out on something that God wants to give us because something about this seemingly strange in some ways, um, set of practices, you know, I think about like shaking the lulav, like that's kind of a weird thing to do, but like, what might God have for us, uh, in these practices, that we have yet to discover. And so I, I would like to see Messianic Judaism uh, or Messianic Jews as individuals taking any kind of steps in that direction, believing that there's something significant to be found there. Great. So that finished, we just finished the first three sections of, of this discussion. And now we're on to the miscellaneous questions. And I think the first one I want to ask is uh, kind of a follow-up, I guess, to Dr. Rosner's point about how it the, the Torah and the life of a Jewish follower of Jesus might look differently. So the question I have, it's for both of you. Um, can a Jewish follower of Jesus live out their calling that God has for them with their spiritual home being the local church? And follow up to that is, would the Holy Spirit call them to the church rather than the Messianic synagogue? So uh, either one of you, uh, Rabbi Josh, how about you, how about you go first on that one? Um, I, I'd like to see... Um, Jewish people in messianic synagogues uh, for the sake of um, for the sake of that testimony uh, that that God it's an anti-supersessionist 
testimony that God didn't send the Messiah to do away with Israel, but that Messiah is God's faithfulness to Israel. And, um, and also uh, in line with what Jen ended with there, to see some of the things that God has given us used in a way that glorifies the Messiah. You know, we just celebrated uh, Sukkot that's loaded with messianic significance and and so in fact that's how i would define torah uh, now in the messianic age for messianic believers is it's got to be within messiah and how it how it glorifies messiah and, and so forth so however um because there's so much i don't know about people's particular uh, lives people's particular callings so much I don't know about what God's plan might be. Uh, no, I would not uh, begrudge or 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 disagree with somebody that says, "Hey, I'm Jewish, but God's called me to to the local church." Um, you know, I would I would support them in what they feel their their calling is, even while I remain committed to the messianic vision, and uh, as that is the most natural home for Jewish believers. Yeah, I mean, I would largely agree. I'm I'm part of an organization called Yachad B'Yeshua, which is bringing together Jewish believers in Messiah from all across the ecclesial spectrum. So there's Messianic Jews, there's Protestant Christian Jews, there's Catholic priest Jews and Eastern Orthodox Jews. And it, it's been a remarkable, um, it's a remarkable community of people from all across the ecclesial and, and synagogue spectrum, really. I mean, there's those who find their home within the traditional Jewish synagogue all of us coming together as Jewish believers in Messiah from these various places. And it's been just a remarkable opportunity to kind of learn different perspectives. So I absolutely think that there's reasons and, and real instances in which God is calling Jews to be part of or leading mainstream congregations. And again, I think that's an incredible witness, right? I mean, what, what better way to, to sort of counteract some of these tropes and stereotypes against Jews than to sort of be in the midst of the Christians who are perpetuating the tropes as a Jew. Um, and so, it, you know, just one example that comes to mind is this this sort of kind of famous um, Catholic cardinal named Cardinal Lustige, who, who, who was a, a Catholic a cardinal in the Catholic Church in France. Uh, and he publicly talked about how his being like this really, um, you know, pretty high up leader in the Catholic Church didn't erase his Jewish identity. And it was only by virtue of his being a cardinal in the Catholic Church that he had sort of a platform by which to talk about the ongoing significance of, of Jewish identity. So I think if there were to be sort of a, a mass Jewish exodus from, from Christian churches, that's a loss for the church in terms of having real living, breathing Jews in their midst who maybe challenge some of the, again, imprecise categories or inaccurate categories that that might get lumped upon Judaism. So again, I think that stands next to my assertion that I would encourage Jews to be taking steps towards Jewish practice and Jewish tradition. And I think those two can in some way coexist and there's, it's fraught with tensions, but those are the tensions that I think are very rich. Like how can, how can this Catholic priest also, you know, be in some meaningful way connected to, to Judaism and the, and the heritage of Judaism? All right. So Dr. Rosner, I actually have a question for you. And that is, how do you deal with the texts such as Galatians 3 that Rabbi Josh brings up that do uh, sound as if they're reprioritizing or even, you know, some, some people make them out to be denigrating the Torah? Uh, what do you think about passages like that in the New Testament? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. Very relevant. I think, um, I mean, I think what we'd almost have to do is like go passage by passage, because one of the things that 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 Josh has already mentioned is, um, I do think we have to pay attention to who Paul's audience is. And I think that's an issue that's, that's um, more on the radar screen of Pauline scholarship now than it has been in the past. I think a flat, you know, sort of traditional reading of Paul, which is influenced by Martin Luther, who had this huge break with the Catholic Church, and he sort of read his story back into Paul, assuming that Paul had this huge break away from Judaism and, and, and entered this thing called Christianity, which was like way superior to Judaism. I think there's this traditional reading of Paul that's being rightly questioned in our day, 
And so now you have, you know, the Paul within Judaism camp of Pauline scholarship, where this whole group of scholars is sort of just taking as a starting point that Paul was a Torah observant Jew till the day that he died. And so I would, again, I would want to go back and sort of revisit some of these key passages, uh, not only with audience in mind, but to try to at least do a mental exercise of if Paul were a Torah observant Jew till the day that he died, like, how do we make sense of this? And I think one of the things in my reading of Paul that is significant um, is reconciling the Paul of his letters with the Paul of Acts. So we've talked a little bit about the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, where you seem to get a model for this sort of variegated practice between Jews and Gentile followers of Messiah. The question being, do Gentile followers of Messiah need to take on Jewish practice? The answer being no, as evidenced by the spirit that came on Gentiles just as it came on Jews in Acts 2. The assumption that doesn't often get named being that, of course, the Jewish followers are still living as Jews. Otherwise, why would it even be a question of whether Gentiles are? You also have Acts 21, where Paul undergoes, you know, these, these prescribed temple rites in order to ward off rumors that he is telling Jews they don't have to care about Judaism anymore. And so one of the things that's sort of troubled me over the years about Pauline scholarship is this ap apparent difference between the Paul of Acts and the Paul of his letters. And I've approached, you know, when I was a grad student, I approached, you know, my New Testament teachers about this. And at least one of them said, well, Acts is not historical. Acts is sort of Luke's portrayal of Paul, and we can't really trust it. And that answer always, like, bothered me because it's in the canon. Like, I'm not able to just sort of dismiss Acts. And so... I think if we look at the New Testament canonically, the canon sort of beseeches us to read the letters through the lens of Acts, right? Acts comes before the letters. And so if we're going to sort of read through the New Testament, what we encounter first is the Paul of Acts. And so I would take that as an indication that we need to take this, this sort of very Jewish, committed to Jewish practice, doing the temple rites, Paul and then approach his letters rather than the other way around, rather than sort of having to sort of throw out Acts or, or make Acts Luke's portrayal of Paul. Um, and so I think that's a key, for me, that's a key um, framework in approaching Paul. Like how can we make sense of the Paul of Acts and the Paul of his letters? And I think if we take this more Torah observant Jewish Paul who circumcises Timothy, um, which, you know, as Paul says later, like that, that obligates Timothy to obey all of Torah, right? Um, I think it actually helps to make sense between these different tensions that we see in Paul. And, and as I said, questions of audience, questions about what has later th Christian theology in the aftermath of the parting of the ways imported into Pauline interpretation. I would sort of want to have a larger conversation about what is our framework for understanding Paul and what are the key questions that need to be asked in doing so. Yeah, I, um, first of all, I do think that Paul was uh, pro Torah, and I think that um, I'm pro Torah. Uh, not, not according to uh, rabbinic standards, but I love the Torah, and Paul loved the Torah. I, I meditate on the Torah. I, I, uh, God transforms me by what I read there. Um, however, the Torah is not the gospel. There's two, two different things going on here in, in the New Covenant Scriptures, in, in both Acts and in Paul's letters. Uh, just one example. Acts 13, uh, 38. Um, let's see. Paul, Paul says, uh, he's speaking to Jews, by the way, here. He says, therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through this one, talking about Yeshua, is proclaimed to you the removal of sins, including all those things from which you could not be set right by the Torah of Moses. Uh, so there, we have to make a distinction. The gospel is not the Torah. It's not the Torah on steroids. It's not, and, and I've seen that not in Jen, uh, Jen's presentation, but I've seen that in other messianic presentations. Oh, the, the, the gospel is just the Torah. It's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Romans 8 makes the same case. God has done through Yeshua, Romans 8, 3, what God has done through Yeshua, what the Torah could not do. And so there's something new on the scene. And this, this something new is really what Paul is zealous for. 
extremely zealous for. Uh, and, and, and like I say in the book, he doesn't go to Jerusalem there in Acts 21. He doesn't go to Jerusalem because of the temple. Acts is very clear. He goes to Jerusalem for the sake of sharing the gospel with his Jewish people. That is what motivates him. And so, I, I, yes, it is assumed in Acts 15 that um, the Jews will be Torah observant. Uh, it's, it's, it's also assumed, it's also assumed in parts of the Bible, including the New Testament, that, that slavery will continue. I'm not equating Torah observance with slavery. I'm, I'm making a more general approach here. Okay, so there, there is this sense in which slavery is, is assumed. We don't fight against it, right? Peter, uh, first Peter chapter two, you know, if you're a slave, you know, be submissive and, uh, you know. And, however, within the context of, within the greater understanding, the greater new covenant understanding and the greater uh, Torah understanding, I would say as well, is this understanding that we are all made in the image of God. And, it, and eventually that deeper message comes out and says, of course, slavery is wrong. Of course, I don't, uh, you know, even if uh, the Torah tells us how to treat slaves, and even if the New Testament says, if you're a slave, do this or that, and uh, we get the deeper meaning here, the deeper thing coming through. And the deeper thing coming through in Acts and in Paul's letters is, is, is the gospel, that the gospel does something that Torah couldn't do. And so with the destruction of the temple, we, we carry with us that, that deeper understanding. Yes, yes, uh, the, uh, the Jews at that Jerusalem council, they expected, they understood uh, Torah observance, um, and, and, and they expected it of Jews. Of course they did. That, that was their milieu. That was their, the way they were raised. That was their way of serving God. That was their way of honoring God. That's the natural way to, to give him glory. But, but deeper than that is, is the gospel message. And so when the, when the, when the temple is, is destroyed, the um and and jews are scattered around the world and all of a sudden there's these huge questions of what does it mean to be torah observant how do i interact with the torah we have to do so from an understanding that rabbinic judaism doesn't have that something greater came it can enlighten torah for us uh and it does but we can't approach torah apart from it how do I approach Torah as a Messianic Jew is a different question than how do I approach Torah as a non-Messianic Jew. And, and I think Paul, Paul makes that clear, like I read earlier in Galatians. He's something changed. Yes, he's talking to Galatians, but he's talking about himself. He's talking about Israel coming into to grace. Something changed. Torah as that pedagogue is no longer serving in that role. So the final question um, I want to ask for both of you, and then one specific question for Rabbi Josh. So the first one is, um, how does one ensure that they are being led by the Holy Spirit? Um, it's, it could be a, too big of a question to ask in the last few minutes, but um, the, the follow-up question for Rabbi Josh is, would the Holy Spirit lead a Jewish follower of Jesus away from following a specific Torah commandment or away from uh, practicing Judaism. So start with the first question, um, Dr. Rosner, how about, how about you start? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. And when I've kind of spent time in more um, charismatic Pentecostal circles, it's something that, that, that comes up quite a bit. And I think um, one of the things that I point out in the, in sort of our concluding reflections in the book is that throughout the book, um, my emphasis is more on the communal aspect of the people of Israel, and Josh's emphasis is more on individuals who are being led in specific ways by the Spirit. Um, and not to privilege one of those over the others, just to note the distinction in our perspectives. And so I would want to say that one of the ways that we confirm the leading of the Spirit is by a community, right? This is how we sort of ensure that we're not on some, like, crazy 
path is is by the validation of a community that's also seeking the spirit and i think i mean again i think this is a very strong precedent in the new testament i think the the you know the fact that peter's astounded that the spirit comes on cornelius and his household sort of leads him to ask questions and then they say wait a second wait we're all perceiving that something's going on and so i think there has to be um, a communal aspect of that uh, that's that's uh, keeping in check uh, what could be just personal desires or, or or whatever else that might be. So I think uh, my main answer to that question would be this importance of a communal context. Uh, and again, I mean, as I said at the beginning, I think that when we're talking about a particularly messianic Jewish approach to the spirit, I would also want to say like, uh, if 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 some uh, I think without getting into particulars, uh, it, I, I would also want to say how is this uh, so-called leading of the spirit? Um, how is it relating to the way that we know God has led the Jewish people throughout the centuries? Right? Is it going against uh, something that um, God seems to command somewhere else? Right? And and if so. Let's talk about that. Let's press into that. Let's let's explore that tension. So again, on one hand, I think there's this communal context. On this, on the other hand, from a particularly messianic Jewish vantage point, I think there's a whole other set of considerations that 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 has to do with God's unique covenant with the Jewish people that I would want to talk about when we raise this issue of the Spirit's leading. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I I think that people need training. Uh, whatever it's in, how to follow Torah, how to follow the spirit. People need, need training in that. That's one of my main jobs as a congregational leader is, is teaching people how to follow the spirit. Um, and, I, and I think that we have to understand the main goal of the spirit. It's not to um, boost our egos. Look at me, I'm the prophet, I'm the this, I'm the that. Uh, but it's look at, I am, look at Messiah, and, and I'm willing to lay down my life for the Messiah. See, what we're, what we're called to is, I believe, impossible apart from the, the Spirit, which is to be like Yeshua. And, and when, when the New Testament talks about being like Yeshua, it, it, it's not referencing him overturning tables in the temple, right? It's not referencing him walking on water. It's, refer, it's referencing the cross, and to find myself having joy and being crucified with Messiah, that, that requires the work of the Spirit. And when we lose that emphasis and it becomes more of a show, look at us, we're, we're prophesying. And I mentioned these things earlier. I want to see prophecies. I want to see healing. I want to see uh, these different, fruit, uh, different gifts of the Spirit being manifested. Uh, however... Uh, when that is emphasized apart from the main role of the spirit is to get you to do something that you and your natural self would not want to do, which is to die to yourself, to deny yourself, to, to find joy in being crucified with Messiah. And so I, I think that this is a major check that, that we've got to preach and teach that, and that that'll help us. Is this glory? Look, Paul says in the uh, 1 Corinthians 14, you know, nobody can, can say, uh, you know, Messiah be cursed if they're being led by the Spirit. Nobody can say Messiah be, uh, Yeshua be, Yeshua is Lord except by the Spirit. I just think he's getting at a general principle there. Is the Spirit uniting us with Messiah, glorifying the Messiah, uh, then, then that's a major check there. And, and remembering the nature of our Messiah and his role, which, which led him in love to the cross, and only then the victory. Um, can the spirit lead away from the Torah? Again, it depends on how you're defining Torah. If you're defining Torah as the main goal of, of the Torah, that you should love others, that you should love your neighbor as yourself, that you should be holy, that you should honor uh, God as holy, then absolutely not. It will, it will never lead away from those main goals of the Torah? Will it lead away from some of the particular mitzvot, some of the particular commandments? Um, absolutely. Um, Paul, for example, 
didn't go to Jerusalem for quite, if you study his missionary journeys, he missed quite a few pilgrimage festivals. Why? For the sake of that which came that wasn't Torah, but was greater than Torah, which is the gospel. So for the sake of the gospel, he doesn't go to Jerusalem. For, it's not like, oh, I'm filled with the spirit of God. I've been saved. All of a sudden, I want to spend all my time at the temple doing the sacrifice. No, it's I've been saved. All of a sudden, my life is about the gospel. And in that living out of the gospel is the living out of the, the Torah's main goal. Hey, this is what Torah wanted all along for us to be living in love. And as I'm living out the gospel, which is me denying myself, me by the spirit becoming like Messiah, um, living that out, I am living out the main goal of the Torah. Um, but yes, I, I do believe that it can lead against, uh, look, uh, uh, Hezekiah's Passover, right? It goes, it goes against Torah. Even if you're unclean, you know, it's the, the second Passover. You know, they came from the North Country. Of course, God would want us to celebrate the Passover. And, and, and the assessment of his life is that he was Torah observant. I forget the exact words uh, that it says there in Chronicles, but... He was Torah observant. Was he particularly Torah observant in everything? It says in, he was Torah observant. I, I, I believe it says in, in everything. It gives a good assessment of his life. Uh, but, but for the sake of love, he overlooks the fact that, yeah, the unclean really shouldn't be here according to the literal words of the Torah. And that's what I think we have in, in the spirit is an awakening to God's greater heart, God's greater plan, so that if I have uh, the words in black and white here, the, the spirit can enliven me. This is what I really wanted all along. This is, this is the, the gem inside of this, uh, inside of these words that you can live out now in the spirit. I'm sure we could keep on asking questions here for a long time and the viewers probably would like us to do that. But now in the portion of our uh, discussion to have some closing remarks and closing words and uh, Rabbi Josh, could uh, you start us off? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, guys, thanks so much. Uh, and, and Jen, thanks so much. It's, it's, it's been a wonderful conversation. I think we got to some really important topics. Uh, he, here is my concern. Um, the amount of, and I brought this out in a previous conversation and in the book, the amount of time and energy it would take for most of our movement to, uh, to start thinking of the rabbis and living as if the rabbis have an authority is it, it, it takes a direction. It, you know, when we got started, I, I mentioned that there is overlap between Jen and I, and there's a difference in, but there's a difference in emphasis. There's a difference in, in some other things as well, but I think there's a lot of difference in emphasis. But, but that emphasis uh, really colors a movement one way or, or another. It, it, really, it really does. Uh, and so if my emphasis is on being more Torah observant and doing so not by simply interacting with the words through the leading of the spirit, through the words of Yeshua, through the letters of Paul and Peter and John, through my local spirit-filled community. But in addition to that, uh, the rabbis now have to speak to me about how to follow the Torah. Uh, the, the issue is how vast their rulings are, how vast the writings are. The Talmud is volume after volume after volume. You know, people add on a few things into their life. I'm not saying this about Jen, of course. Uh, and her and my brother have a deep, meaningful life in this area. But, you know, just to add on a few things and all of a sudden, oh, I'm, I'm doing with the, you know, I'm an Orthodox Jew or whatever. It really takes time. It takes study. Uh, it takes a lifetime, really, to understand the Talmud itself. And so it's going to take that, em that emphasis, that direction in my life away from 
unless I was raised in it, it's natural to me and, and it just is a part of my life and my community. It's going to take tremendous effort instead of just meditating in the Lord's presence, instead of just worshiping him, instead of just being led by the spirit, instead of just reading the new covenant, interacting with other spirit filled believers. Now I've got this tremendous weight on my shoulders and Jen doesn't want this, I understand, but it's going to happen. I feel if we're not careful with the way we teach it. Oh, the Talmud. Oh, I've got to learn this. I've got to learn that. What's the response? What does the rabbi say? And all of a sudden, instead of asking what's the spirit saying, what is the New Testament saying about Torah, I'm asking what are the rabbis saying? What are the non-messianic rabbis saying? And I think that's a, a, a direction we should not go down. Uh, Dr. Rosner, would you, would you like to say to us in our, your last words? Yeah, I mean, I, I want to come back first to this point that I've made a couple times, which is I think that the Messianic Jewish movement in general hasn't yet adequately wrestled with a doctrine of the Holy Spirit, a uniquely Messianic Jewish doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And so my hope with this book, my hope with these conversations is that uh, they would be a catalyst for further conversation in our movement about the coming of the Spirit. And particularly, what does that have to do with our unique calling as Jews? The, the, the relevance of Torah observance in our lives, the authority of the rabbinic movement. I mean, these are the kinds of conversations that um, I, I hope uh, continue in our movement. And it's one of the things that I appreciate most about Josh's position is the utter seriousness with which he takes the active leading of the spirit in our lives. And I do think, and I think this is a lot of what you see um, in, in sort of the, the, exposing of uh, the Pharisees and the Gospels, for example, is that Torah had taken on a place that uh, eventually ended up um, being misguided or, or needed correction or uh, was leading to a, a posture of judgment towards others. And so I think there are these inherent uh, dangers within Judaism. And I, and I so appreciate the way that Josh pushes us to really consider what is the spirit speaking to us? How is the spirit leading us as individuals? And, and, and I would want to say, you know, let's talk about that in our communities as well. With that being said, um, I think what comes out in the book and probably what's come out even in this conversation is that Josh's posture towards these issues assumes more of a default tension between Torah and the spirit. Like, like even in what he just said, right? So if we're, if we're concerned with all these, you know, dictates in the Talmud, it's going to take us away from, from, you know, meditating upon the scriptures and, and the work of Christ and these things. Um, and I, um, I suppose I have a curiosity about, uh, is that like inherent tension and, and sort of struggling, uh, sort of this like zero sum approach, is that true? Or could it be that there's more of a complementary approach between the two, right? Could it be that we are destined to have deeper encounters with the spirit of God, the more that we press into, again, this rich heritage of Torah and, and, the, and the, the calendar rhythms and the, and the ways of life that God has laid out for the Jewish people. And so um, without saying we need to spend 12 hours a day studying the Talmud, which is going to take our time away from other things, that's where I would sort of advocate for taking little steps, like, like, like this Messianic Jewish leader uh, advised me 15 years ago, like, just light candles on Shabbat, you know, like as Shabbat comes in, uh, just like, let's see if God has something for us, believing that the Torah is still relevant to us and that there's a reason that God told us to do certain things uh, and believing that the spirit might uh, be found in those things as opposed to it taking us away from the leading of the spirit. So, so again, a difference in emphasis but, but my, my overall desire would be that this book would um, help Messianic Jews to continue to ask questions about Torah and the spirit and how those interact in our lives and in our communities. Well, thank you, Rabbi Josh and Dr. Rosner for such an excellent and meaningful discussion. I think if people pick up your book, uh, the book that you both co-wrote, they'll see that uh, you both of you do not talk past each other. And we've seen that exemplified in this discussion. So yes, I, I would encourage everyone to go out on Amazon or wherever you buy books and pick up their book called At the Foot of the Mountain, Two Views on Torah and the Spirit. 
And the link is in the description below and also Rabbi Josh's and Dr. Rosner's websites are there as well. So if you have any more questions um, that you have come to your come to mind as you're watching this video or you just come to them later, uh, definitely subscribe to the channel and get the book because uh, there's definitely more in there. And also, I just want to say that we just finished a wonderful season celebrating and observing Jewish holidays, including Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, and Simchat Torah. But many Christians find this strange, in part because they think Colossians 2, verse 16 through 17, teaches that Jewish festivals, along with Shabbat and kosher laws, are no longer binding. And I want to say that in our next video, I'm going to show why that view is a misinterpretation of the text and one that Paul would not endorse himself. So if you're interested in that video, Messianic Judaism, or just the Jewishness of the New Testament more generally, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell so you can join us on Two Messianic Jews. Thanks for watching and see you next time.